One of the continuing uh, sort of uh, myths, if you will, or points of lore in Roswell is that there were hundreds of witnesses. And in fact, when you start boiling down the witnesses to the ones that really matter, and I use witnesses with quotes around it, quite frankly, because many of the people listed as witnesses were just people who you got directions from, I mean literally so, the kid at the gas station who told you how to make the right turn to get down to the, uh, you know, to Corona or whatever. Um, when you boil this down, you've got f only 41 people who legitimately can be considered to be first or second-hand witnesses to something relevant to the case at the time. All right? When you still boil the thing down still further to try to figure out who actually had credibly could be considered to have actually seen something of the physical material that was recovered, you get down to 23. When you take it down still further to those who you know saw the stuff and are claiming odd properties associated with it that suggest otherworldly origins, the number is down to seven. And actually, you can really say six, because one of those was Colonel Blanchard, who was the commander of the base, who authorized the release of the press announcement that, that uh, brought the whole case to the world's attention. In his case, you can't really say he thought there were odd properties. He just thought he had a flying saucer. So you've got a half a dozen people, uh, the two Marcells, Jesse Marcell, the intelligence officer, and his son, Dr. Jesse Marcell, who was 11 at the time. Um, and uh, uh, Loretta Proctor and her husband and a couple of others. And if you look at everything that they have to say, their comments about odd properties are embedded in a much larger body of testimony that points directly to an earthly mundane source, which was this classified project uh, codenamed Mogul uh, that was going on about 100 miles away. So you don't really have hundreds of witnesses at all. You've got this tiny handful of people. Uh, when, you when you get to the more exotic part of the story, which is the bodies, there are only four people who have been interviewed by investigators and who, who have been identified publicly who claim to have had direct first-hand experience with the bodies. One of them uh, is Frank Kaufman, the late Frank Kaufman, who is not credible. There's a tremendous amount of information available on him, and, and my book's got an entire chapter devoted to him that points that out. There's Jim Ragsdale, who told tall tales, and nobody seems to agree, or everyone seems to agree, regardless of where they are on this case, that he's not credible. Um, uh, you have Gerald Anderson, who, uh, once again, is a highly non-credible witness. and. Um, the fourth one, if I could think of the name. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> sorry about that one. Uh, but the point is, is that you've got, you have, you have, uh, oh, uh, Albert Lovejoy Duran is the fourth person. So you have Ragsdale, Kaufman, um, uh, Gerald Anderson, and Albert Lovejoy Duran, who was allegedly an army officer, now retired, who only appears as a throwaway in a, th in a footnote in Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt's second book. Uh, the truth about the UFO crash at Roswell, which I find an interesting title, but in any event, um, he just appears and goes away. So here you, what have you got? You've got this, you've got four not credible witnesses. Uh, you have another person who was anonymous, whom I in my book call New Mexico Jones, who called Kevin Randall anonymously and claimed to have been on the site and seen the bodies and, and been chased off by the army and so on. Uh, to the most exotic part of the whole story. You have a whole slew of people who claim second and third hand knowledge to this exotic stuff, and that's it, and most of them are not credible. Uh, you have a half a dozen people uh, who actually, you can say for sure, really did see the physical stuff and handled it, uh, who claim a certain amount of you know, peculiarity about the stuff, but it's in the context of a discussion or of a testimony that talks about all of the things that match up to Project Mogul. So that's the case. I mean, that's Roswell. And yet here we have this wonderful Roswellian myth. Um, you know, and then uh, if you take it a step further and say, okay, where, what, does, what did the government really know? What about this big cover-up that has been alleged? Um, where is there evidence that will support the claim that the government had 
recovered a crashed flying saucer in July of 1947, or any other time. And when you go into the formerly classified record, which is now quite substantial, and this is the formerly classified record of communications uh, between and amongst the people whose job it was <clears throat> to crack the flying saucer mystery back in those days. Uh, very senior level military people, very senior level scientists, and so on. What you discover is not only is Roswell never mentioned, not even in passing, you discover uh, that physical evidence is discussed at great length in many cases, always in terms of lamenting the fact that they didn't have any. And uh, one of the, to me, one of the, the thing that, one instance that sums up all of this, and there's much more where you can read it. In fact, I reproduce the, many of the documents in my book, in an appendix, I reproduce these, uh, these communications. The one thing that kind of sums up all of this frustration on the part of the people who wanted to get to the bottom of the flying saucer mystery, and the military took it extremely seriously in those days. They were very concerned. They thought it was a, you know, we were dealing with a, a real possible threat situation. Was uh, the, uh, uh, the presentation that Colonel uh, Howard M. McCoy gave before the first substantive meeting of the United States Air Force Scientific Advisory Board in March of 1948. The, the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board is a group of scientists and other experts that advise the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force on um, technical and scientific matters bearing on the mission of the service. At this time, it was chaired by Theodore von Karman, a very famous rocket scientist. Many other extremely prominent people served on this. Um, Colonel McCoy was the head of intelligence uh, for the Air Materiel Command at Wright Field, and in his organization was the Air Force Flying Saucer Investigation Group, at that time codenamed Project Sign. March of 1948, he's making a presentation, a summary presentation of the activities of his organization, briefing up, if you will, the board on all of the things that they're doing and things of importance. And he's, uh, he talks about the one item of foreign equipment recently acquired, about which he's quite excited. It's a Soviet prop-driven fighter. He then goes on and talks briefly about Project Paperclip, the program that involved bringing uh, German scientists into the United States to work on programs for us after the war. And in the next paragraph, he says, you might be surprised to learn that as a result of all the flying saucer excitement of last summer, we have a new project called Project Sign to look into this. We have some 300 reports that have not been reported publicly from highly credible witnesses, uh, pilots and scientists and others. And we're taking this very, very seriously. And then, you have no idea how much we wish one of these things would crash somewhere where we could recover it and find out what they are. This is March of 1948. Uh, Roswell took place in July of 1947. This was a classified briefing. This was a classified briefing to the very senior people who advised the Chief of Staff of the Air Force on just the kind of thing that the Flying Saucer Project was concerning itself with. And you can see this kind of thing repeated over and over and over again in the communications amongst these people in classified documentation, classified top secret, secret, and other levels. Um, uh, I have in my files uh, 40 some odd, I think it's 41 documents in this category in which this kind of discussion takes place. Um, and there's no way in the world that these people would have dissembled in their discussions. I mean, it was you don't lie to each other when you're working together on the same problem of trying to solve the, the case, if you will. Um, and, and on top of that, at that time, there was no Freedom of Information Act. There was no reason on the part of these people to believe that anyone other than their own colleagues would ever see this material. So they wouldn't have been trying to fudge things to just in case you know somebody gets their hands on it. Uh, so to me, that's kind of the nail, the final nail in the coffin of Roswell. And there's you know there's no evidence anywhere in those records that that there was any physical evidence in in the hands of the U.S. government or any of its allies that of the sort that allegedly was recovered at Roswell. And then you also in one further step take a look at at, at you have to take a look at defense policy and programs, U.S. and others, from 1947 to the present. And nowhere there can you find any evidence of any kind of a response to a, to a perceived threat from outer space. 
except something launched from this planet up through the atmosphere, out into space, and back again, you know. Uh, yet you can see clear, direct responses to other threats, like the Soviet bomber threat, uh, the ICBM threat, all the other kinds of things that have cropped up over the decades. It's, it, it's clearly identifiable. You can see it without question. But there's nothing, nothing to do with the response to a potential flying saucer threat. So, you know, either, either the people who are in charge of national defense policy all these many years are incredibly malfeasant, were incredibly malfeasant, and the ones that are still alive should be prosecuted, uh, or there wasn't a threat. I, I don't see how we can arrive at any other conclusion.